Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Purdy. I'm a marketing manager here at Bond Shenick and King. I'd like to welcome you to this week's COVID-19 webinar presentation. Two quick housekeeping items before we get started. Please enter your questions through the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and our presenters will do the best they can to address those throughout today's presentation. Once the webinar has ended, if you would take a brief moment to complete the survey, we would greatly appreciate that. So to get things started, I'm going to hand it over to Pete Jones. Thank you, Kathy, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've got a, a full program for you today, and we're going to start off with uh, Jeff Shear. Jeff is going to give us an update on um, what's going on with the payroll protection program, uh, the SBA questionnaire, and, 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 and other uh, updates of note. Jeff, take it away. Thanks a lot, Pete. It's great to be uh, great to be back on the program with everybody. We're going to get right to it. Um, if uh, just a, a little bit of a reminder, if everyone remembers uh, back in uh, May um, on the Paycheck Protection Program, there was a lot of discussion about whether borrowers needed their money or not. It was called a necessity test, and um, the SBA has decided to issue a loan necessity questionnaire, uh, which uh, drafts of these questionnaires came out last week um, and were published in the Federal Register, uh, but they're not necessarily official official yet, but banks are starting to use these forms and provide these forms to their borrowers. Uh, these, uh, this necessity questionnaire applies to those borrowers that have loans in excess of $2 million. Um, if people remember, uh, loans amounts or borrowers with loans of less than $2 million were deemed to have needed the dollars and the money. Uh, loans in excess of $2 million, that question still remains. Um, the, the concern that a lot of us have raised with these questionnaires is that um, if, if, again, some of you remember, at the time we were discussing the necessity issue, we talked about what you knew at the time you applied for the loan. Um, what did you know at that time about uh, your, your business? What did you anticipate? Um, these questionnaires really focus on uh, what happened to, to your operations and what was your liquidity like during the covered period. This is a very, very different, um, different test. And whether your covered period is eight weeks or 24 weeks or something in between, um, it really could, be, uh, could, could make a big difference. So the, the purpose of these forms is really to help with the review of the, the certification that a lot of borrowers made, that the economic uncertainty made the loan request necessary to support operations. But again, the questions that are asked, and we're gonna get into these during my time here, the questions that were asked were really, uh, really look like uh, they're looking at what happened during these covered periods. Uh, and that's a problem. So um, I went through the history a little bit. If you, uh, another reminder, there was a safe harbor uh, that came into play with these loans in excess of $2 million. The SBA did ask a lot of borrowers with the, uh, to, to look at uh, their operating needs, their liquidity, um, and those that, that reviewed their, their records and said, you know what, maybe we really didn't need these monies. There was a safe harbor and you could return the monies by, uh, I think it was mid-May. Um, however, um, there was, uh, there's also a provision that was uh, outlined in the SBA FAQs, uh, specifically number 46, that said that if during the course of the SBA review of your loan, the SBA determined that you lacked an adequate basis uh, for needing the dollars and couldn't make the certification that the current business environment uh, required you to, to borrow these funds, if during the course of the SBA review that determination was made, you could return the monies at that point in time. So there still exists a safe harbor if we go through the process of filling out this form and the SBA determines that the borrower really didn't need the monies, um, despite what the borrower thinks, um, the borrower could still return the dollars um, and not suffer any uh, detrimental effects. Um, so what I want to do in the, the remaining, uh, you know, about five minutes here is really look at what the forms are asking for both um, not-for-profit borrowers and for-profit borrowers. So first is form 3510. Um, they, uh, these forms, just as a note, there will be a client alert coming out from our, my office um, within the next uh, couple of hours. Um, I believe there are links to both forms on the client alert. 
lot of the information I'm providing will be on that alert together with the forms. Uh, so you'll be able to see, you'll be able to review everything I'm talking about. So the form 3510, which is not for profit borrowers, um, there's both of these forms are divided into two sections. One section is business activities and the second is liquidity. So on your business activities, the SBA is gonna ask questions about what your gross receipts and expenses were during 2019 uh, and during the same period in 2020. So looking at the kind of covered period, time period in 2019 versus 2020, did your business uh, slow down? Did you have less revenue? Um, they're gonna ask if there was a state or local shutdown order in place that forced you to alter operations. And, and, as, and, and you will need to provide proof of the dates and probably copies of the shutdown orders. And I know that we have on our website, um, I believe there was a client alert that outlined all of the shutdown orders specific to, uh, to industry um, uh, that you can find on our site. You can obviously ask one of us. Um, questions will involve whether you voluntarily ceased or reduced operations uh, or whether you did any capital improvements. So they're really looking at was there in fact a business slowdown um, and you know did you have excess monies to do capital improvements? So you know these are things that you know I don't think a lot of borrowers anticipated when uh, they made the initial certification that they needed the monies, but maybe business wasn't as bad. Maybe things looked a little better. Maybe they had some excess funds to do capital improvements. Again, this seems kind of contrary to what we were told when the initial certification was made. The liquidity questions that apply to uh, not-for-profit entities, exempt entities, um, looking at how much you had in cash savings and cash investments. Um, if you prepaid any debt during the covered period, do you know, in other words, did you have excess monies? There are a lot of borrowers that I know that drew down completely on their line of credit uh, before the covered period because they were afraid it was going to be frozen, had the cash on their books, and then during the covered period ended up repaying their line of credit. You know, there's a question, you know, is that going to affect your liquidity? Did that mean that you had liquidity if you actually borrowed money so you had to pay back? There are questions about uh, whether you paid and how much you paid salaries in excess of $250,000. This is a totally, um, uh, this number is, uh, is totally random. If you look at the statute, the number, the, the salary that we always talked about with $100,000 when looking at um, kind of the employee costs that you could include in your PPP funds. Here, they're, they're, you know, are they saying that anybody that should, was paid in excess of $250,000 shouldn't have been, and if you were paying them, maybe they should have taken a bigger pay cut, or maybe they were making too much money, or maybe that meant you had excess dollars. So I'm not really sure what they're getting at, but these are the kind of questions that are being asked. Um, for borrowers with endowments, for not-for-profits with endowment, they're gonna ask about you know, what your endowment is. Um, did you have restrictions on the use of that endowment? What your non-cash investments are, which are gonna include um, uh, marketable securities, uh, include real estate um, and, and the like. So really looking at you know, what source of funds that you had um, both prior to and during the, uh, the covered period. Um, higher ed clients, you're gonna be asked, if you, if you haven't seen this already, you're gonna be asked to provide tuition information. Um, did you reduce tuition? Did you see a decrease in revenue because of reduced tuition? Um, you know, these are all things that maybe was anticipated when we made application back in, uh, in April, um, but maybe things turned out maybe better or worse than we expected. Um, for for-profit borrowers, um, again, the, the application, the form 3509, sorry, not the application, but this form 3509 is also divided into two sections, business activities and liquidity. Um, again, with business activities, they're gonna look at gross revenue numbers between uh, comparing 2019 and 2020, looking at whether you were uh, subject to any state or local shutdown orders and whether you voluntarily ceased or reduced operations and why. There are opportunities within these forms to explain maybe why you continued paying salaries in excess of $250,000, or maybe why you paid down debt, but the explanations themselves are limited to 1,000 characters, um, which is like nothing. I mean, it really doesn't give you a lengthy spot to really uh, uh, provide an explanation, so your explanation really has to be succinct. For for-profit borrowers on the liquidity questions, a lot of the same questions that I mentioned that they're asking on exempt borrowers. What was your cash position? Did you pay any dividends? 
in excess of those that you normally pay for estimated tax payments. And this is a real thing. I remember talking to a lot of borrowers about shareholder and member distributions during the covered period, whether they should be made or not. Or not. A lot of borrowers said, hey, our shareholders or members were closely held companies. Our shareholders and members really rely on these distributions to pay their personal expenses. This isn't just fluff money. Um, but they're asking the question whether these dividends or distributions were paid. Again, how much debt may have been prepaid, um, whether you paid compensation in excess of $250,000. There are questions of whether you are owned or whether you are publicly traded or, or owned by a uh, private equity or, or a publicly traded entity, um, and some questions about affiliates. So, And then at the end of the form, um, they're asking for an additional certification. Um, after you fill out the form, you have to recertify that all the all the information you're providing is accurate and uh, provided in the in the uh, to your best ability. Um, acknowledging that uh, that if you did not uh, provide the information to uh, that that's accurate information, you could be subject to prosecution. So you know, again, this was just a real quick highlight of what these forms are. I've, I've outlined a number of things that I see that are wrong with these forms and inconsistent with the statute, but. Banks are starting to require these forms. They're requiring you to return them within 10 days of, of being provided the forms. I don't see it consistent from bank to bank. Some banks haven't provided the forms yet. Um, I think the best that we can do is fill out these forms to the best of our ability, uh, provide explanations that may explain why we paid uh, down debt or why we made capital improvements, um, and, and really just do the best that we can to show that we had a need at the time the application was made, even though things probably turned out a little bit better than we expected, or maybe they turned out worse than we expected. Um, so take a look for the client alert that's coming out. Um, and we, as always, are happy to review uh, your answers to these questionnaires as you, uh, as you prepare them. That's all I have for today, Pete. Jeff, uh, just real quick, I think you mentioned two safe harbors, right? There was the original safe harbor, um, and, and now there's one that you're, um, talking about here that if as a result of this questionnaire um, there's a question about whether the loan needs to be paid back um, there's a second safe harbor correct there there always actually was this second safe harbor back in um, uh, I think it was May when when this issue really came up um, FAQ 46 um, of the SB, on the SBA frequently asked questions does indicate that if the SBA reviews your application remember the bank reviews it for 60 days, the SBA has another 90 days to review it. If during the SBA review, they say, you know what? We don't think you had the need for money and so you have to pay it back. If you pay it back immediately, and there is a period of time where you can contest that, but if you pay it back, the SBA will back off then and say, you know, we're not going to come after you with any other, you know, no, no guns a blazing coming after you. Uh, we'll kind of forgive and forget at that point. And they're not going to refer to any other uh, uh, department within uh, within Department of Justice or anything to go after you. So that's like a second safe harbor if they determine that you should get the dollars back. Okay, great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions on that. Um, let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, and and we wanted to talk about the travel advisory. Um, it's on everybody's minds. We talked about it last Tuesday. We got a number of questions. Uh, in this webinar, uh, we did a separate standalone webinar on Friday. It was only a half an hour long, and we got 150 questions from people. So it became apparent to us that this is still a matter that people are uh, grappling with. So we thought we'd spend a little bit of additional time on it today. Um, let me give you the overview of, um, of what's happened here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Adam Master Leo to talk a little bit about uh, some of the difficult questions that, that people are, are raising and trying to figure out. Um, so uh, a new travel guidance document did come out November 3rd, um, and some new rules are, are in effect now. Let me see if I can summarize those rules for you. Um, and I'm gonna break it down into four different situations because I think those are the situations that we have to be uh, concerned about. First of all, if someone is traveling to New York State from one of the contiguous states, um, they are not subject to the travel advisory. I think this is a practical decision that was made that it is just too difficult to administer the travel advisory with respect to the states that border New York. 
Um, now that doesn't mean that uh, people shouldn't be careful uh, if they think they've been exposed or that some of the other rules regarding exposure and proximate contact uh, do not apply, they do. Uh, but the travel guidance um, is not going to affect the travel from contiguous states. Uh, second situation is if an individual travels to New York State um, having been out of the state for less than 24 hours. Um, and in that situation, um, you, are, you are not going to need to test. Um, there's no quarantine, um, but an individual must fill out the travel form. And so that's that you know, sort of quick trip uh, to one of the non-contiguous states and then back um, less than 24 hours in one of the non-contiguous states. Um, we don't have any requirements other than the travel form. The third situation, and I think this is probably the bulk of the situations that will arise if the traveler's been out of New York State for more than 24 hours uh, and coming from a non-contiguous state, uh, the new travel advisory rules um, are, can be summarized as follows. The baseline rule is that an individual must quarantine, quarantine for 14 days. That's a familiar uh, requirement. A lot of people, probably a lot of people on this call have actually done that because of their summer vacation schedule or, or, or whatnot. Um, but what's added in the new travel advisory is the ability to test out of that quarantine um, if you meet the, the, the following requirements. You test within 72 hours of arriving in New York State, um, that you quarantine for three days after arrival in New York State, and that you take a second test on day four if both of the tests are negative, the one that you received within 72 hours of arrival in New York and the test on day four, then you may exit quarantine. So a simple way to look at it is 14 day baseline quarantine and the ability to test out if you take those two tests. Uh, if people don't take both those tests, the 14 day quarantine is still available. Um, there was some confusion, some, some uh, suggestion that maybe people would not be able to enter New York. I think it's clear now from the travel guidance that they may enter New York, um, but they're going to be subject to the 14-day quarantine if they don't get that uh, test uh, before they get here. Um, and then the test on day four, and both tests need to be negative. The final category, the fourth category, um, a little different set of rules for essential workers, okay? Um, and the definition of essential worker can be found on the Empire State Development uh, website. And so we'll know exactly who those folks are. Um, and the special rules uh, fall into several different categories, but let me focus on people who have, will stay in New York State for more than 36 hours. Uh, so, so people who are really coming back to be in New York. Um, and if you're an essential worker coming from a non-contiguous state and you're going to be here for more than 36 hours, you may work right away. Um, you must test on day four um, and that test will need to be negative. Um, there, there has been some question about whether there are any additional requirements. It looks like the, the current travel guidance doesn't have any additional requirements for people who are going to be staying the so-called long-term uh, stay in New York. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's where it sits right now. Um, now, there are a number of permutations. I've tried to give you the overview of uh, what the rules are and do it hopefully reasonably succinctly. Um, but that was the easy part, and I, I chose the easy part. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Adam um, for the more difficult questions, uh, the permutations that we have and, and how we deal with them. Pete, thanks so much. And um, the questions keep rolling in. So uh, what I did was I went through the questions that we got last week during this webinar, in addition to the 150 questions that we got when we did the webinar on Friday, the pop-up webinar. And I've tried to kind of categorize them into groups. We are now in approximately, we've, we've had the guidance for about a week and a half. So we've been able to digest it. We've been able to really process a little, in a little more detail what exactly the state is asking everyone to do, but it's also the time has allowed us to come up with the issues that haven't been answered. Now, I'm seeing a number of questions right now in the chat that I want to answer right off the bat. So first of all, uh, first question, 
where does the first test have to be taken? And I think that that's a good question. Uh, what the guidance says is that you have to obtain a test within 24 hours prior to arrival in New York. So um, if you are in another state for a week, I think that's easy to interpret. You have to get the test in that state within 72 hours of when you arrive in New York. Um, the word within implies that the test doesn't have to be three days from when you arrive in New York. It has to be just within those 72 hours. So in theory, the test could be taken on the same day that you're leaving the state. If we use the vacation example, if I'm going to Florida, I could take the test for a week, I could take the test on the same day that I'm leaving Florida while I'm in Florida. It doesn't have to be three days before I leave uh, the state of Florida. Another question that arises out of, out of this, uh, the pre-arrival test is, do I have to have the negative test in my hand when I land in New York? And I think a lot of the confusion comes from statements the governor uh, has made. And, and I actually wrote down a quote from one of the governor's press conferences. He said, quote, you should not land if you do not have proof of a negative test upon landing. So that in conjunction with his statement that he's gonna be dispatching the National Guard has led some people to the conclusion that, oh geez, if I don't have a negative test in my hand, I can't enter New York State. Well, that's not what the guidance says. The guidance says that the test has to be completed within 72 hours of when you leave the non-contiguous state. So in theory, you could take a test in Florida, a PCR test. You're not gonna have the results of that PCR test on you when you land in New York, when you fly back. So the guidance doesn't say that if you don't have a negative test in your hand, you're not gonna be allowed in the state. Um, I think that at worst, if you get confronted in New York State and you don't have proof of the negative test, you're going to be told you need to quarantine for 14 days. But again, if you have proof that you did get a negative test ultimately in the state, you have your three days of quarantine and then you have proof of your second test in New York, you get to test out. So I think that the governor's statements were a little misleading. They are not what they don't follow what the travel guidance says. So we are following the travel guidance, which was provided by the DOH. All right. Next now, question. Can I just can I just yeah. jump in real quick? I mean, I th th this is you know sort of consistent with what we've seen in the past in a lot of areas, where you've got you know statements in the press conference not necessarily matching up with with guidance, and so I don't think it's that surprising. And I think no. we've across the board sort of said, look, we'll follow the guidance because you know that's more reliable than uh, you know answers in a press conference or even the statements. Right now. Um, next question that I, I, I've been seeing a lot. What if I don't get a test while I'm in the other state, the non-contiguous state? Do I have to follow these requirements strictly in order to test out? And I think the answer to that is going to be yes. You do have to follow the strict requirements. You have to get tested within 72 hours of leaving, uh, of arriving in New York. You have to get quarantined for three days and then test on day four. Most scenarios are easy to understand or to apply that guidance to. However, there is one situation that I think we, we don't know the answer to. You have a situation where somebody travels to, let's say Rhode Island, which is a non-contiguous state for 48 hours, and then they return to New York. Technically, they could get the first test in New York because that would be within 72 hours of when they arrive back in New York. However, I don't think that follows the spirit of the guidance. The spirit of the guidance is that you get tested while you are in the non-contiguous state. So there's this conflict between the spirit of the guidance and what the guidance actually says. And I think that that issue is still open and outstanding and we don't necessarily have an answer to it. One thing I wanted to point out and someone in the, the comments uh, pointed this out as well. If you are in a state, a non-contiguous state for less than 24 hours, you still have to get tested on day four. There is a testing requirement that you get tested on day four. You don't have to quarantine when you return to New York, but you do have to get tested. All right, other questions we've been getting quite a bit. What type of test is acceptable? Um, is it only PCR testing or is the rapid test acceptable? The guidance does not specify what type of test is acceptable. Uh, however, both types of tests have been um, approved by the FDA. So 
or we are operating under the assumption that either type the rapid test or the PCR test would be acceptable to test out under the travel guidance. All right, um, next question, and Pete touched on this a little bit, and that is how have the rules or have the rules for essential workers changed? If you're going through this analysis, right, you, 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 one of the first questions you're gonna ask is, is the person who's traveling an essential worker? And if the person is an essential worker, what are the rules for when they come back? What are the circumstances under which they can return to work? Um, we saw in the prior guidance that essential workers had a number of um, criteria that they had to meet in order to return to work. One of them being getting tested within 24 hours of their return. Then they also had to monitor their symptoms for 14 days and stay out of the public as much as possible for 14 days. This new travel guidance has simplified the guidance for long-term essential workers. Now, long-term essential workers can work so long as they get tested on day four after they're back in New York State. There's been some confusion about whether they're required to quarantine for the first three days. And it's our interpretation that uh, uh, the first three days is not, a quarantine is not required for those first three days. So essential workers now, when they return, can go right back to work, but have to get tested on day four. The last one, Pete, I'm, I'm running out of time here, but the last one I wanted to uh, quickly comment on is the paid leave issue. So with any COVID related issue, I think you start with the question of what COVID leave is available. We know that there is state, New York state, uh, emergency paid sick leave, COVID leave, and we have federal uh, paid leave under the FFCRA. So analyze whether there's going to be paid leave under either of those statutes first. So you start with New York, if someone's traveling for non-business related reasons and they know about, uh, they know that if they travel, they won't get New York paid leave, then they are not going to be entitled to New York state paid COVID leave. So then you move to the FFCRA. Under the old rule, when a 14 day quarantine was required, um, there was some confusion. There isn't clear guidance from the state or from the federal government on this issue, but our interpretation has been that FFCRA leave may be available uh, to employees who are subject to the travel quarantine. Now, the new test out option changes the analysis a little bit. Under the new guidance, an employee can test out presumably on day four uh, of their quarantine. So they might only have to miss four days of work if they follow the guidance. Uh, if an employee chooses not to follow the guidance and not to test out, they are then subject to the full 14 day quarantine. Our interpretation of this change is that now FFCRA leave may be available for those first four days when it's going, when a quarantine is required for everyone. But if an employee chooses not to test out, then the FFCRA leave would not be available following that fourth day of quarantine. So that is uh, the FFCRA issue. Um, and Pete, I don't know if you have any follow-ups for me, but I, I wanted to go through those quickly because those are the questions that we're really seeing the most. So Adam, there's a question here about, um, you know, basically what else besides, um, for essential workers, what else besides um, testing on, on day four is required? And I think I had alluded to this, but I'll let you sort of uh, walk us through. Uh, it really depends on the amount of time that somebody stays, uh, uh, you know, is intended Correct. to travel to New York. Correct. So the travel guidance lays out three scenarios for the essential worker exemption. When an essential worker is going to be in the state for a short period of time, less than 24 hours, a medium period of time, less than uh, uh, 36 hours, and then, or excuse me, short term is less than 12 hours, medium term less than 36, long term greater than 36 hours. <laughs> so the restrictions that are applicable to an essential employee depend on how long they're gonna be in the state. For short term, there's no testing that's required, but there are certain restrictions. Same thing for uh, medium term. For long term, the new revised travel guidance got rid of all of the restrictions except the employee has to get tested on day four. Okay, the other thing is, um, I, I, 
I see here in the comments a few, let me just clarify this. I think you did. Um, it looks like I may have misspoken and I apologize. Yeah, for that. that's okay. That, that's some what I people, Some people had indicated um, I, that I, I did leave out the testing requirement for people who are out of New York for less than 24 hours um, uh, and, and for coming from a non-contiguous state. So let's be clear about that, that um, you fill out the form and um, you need to take a diagnostic test on the fourth day after arrival in New York. Yeah, one other thing that I would point out that I think is helpful, anyone who's traveling to New York from a non-contiguous state has to fill out the travel and health form. That's something else that's been clarified in this most recent guidance. The only time you don't have to fill out the travel or health form is if you're traveling from a contiguous state. So that's, that's something else to point out that I think we've been getting a lot of questions about. So thank you. All right, great. Well, thank you. Um, and um, I think we're uh, ready to move on now to Katie. Um, Katie's going to give us an update on uh, what's happening around the state. All right, here we go. Um, yeah, one other thing to note too with the travel advisory uh, changes, this also applies to international travel. Um, I saw a few questions in there about that. So this test out ability applies uh, for international travel for level two and level three countries. Um, turning then to New York, uh, yesterday the governor announced new cluster updates. Um, there are new yellow zones in Erie, Monroe, and Onondaga counties. Uh, these cluster zones are very large. Uh, they are pretty expansive. The Erie one, you know, goes from the top of Niagara County uh, down pretty, pretty far. Same thing with Monroe, same thing with Onondaga. Um, they are large. Um, we currently have, I believe it's 11 cluster zones uh, in New York. I'm sure someone will count much faster than I can and uh, tell me whether or not that's correct, but I think it's 11. Um, and why that's significant is we've seen that this is working, but last week um, the Lieutenant Governor did say, we obviously need to rethink the cluster strategy for more rural and really quite frankly, upstate Western New York areas. Um, I'm including some of these maps that were released. Um, you can go and, and take a look at them. We're going to be putting out an information memo that will have links to the maps. You can go on um, forward.ny.gov and type in your address or an address of anywhere to see if it's impacted by a cluster zone. So that last one was the Erie County one. This is the Monroe County one, really focuses on Rochester and the suburbs of Rochester. Um, and then finally, we have the Onondaga County one. Um, obviously focusing on Syracuse, Liverpool, um, and then other areas in, the, in that area. Um, what does that mean ultimately for people? Um, I'm just including the yellow zone restrictions here because really every, most of the zones in New York State at this point are yellow zones. Um, Non-essential gatherings have to be limited to 25 people. That will be important uh, in, in something I'm going to mention later on. Houses of worship, you know, it's still that 50% capacity. Um, so please, you know, remember that. Restaurants, this is really the, you know, the two big things that happen with restrictions. It's restaurants, you have to limit to four people at a table. And then this last part, I, I don't include this as, as a restriction. I include it as a, an additional obligation that schools have to take on. Um, schools in yellow zones have to test 20% of their students, staff, and teachers each week. Um, that is, you know, the only thing that's really changed from when these yellow zone restrictions were first issued. Um, when they were first issued, gyms and personal care services had to be closed in yellow zones. That changed. Um, they no longer have to be closed in yellow zones. Um, there are no business shutdowns because of yellow zones at this point. Um, it's really to be a warning sign of uh, potential things to come. And so keep that in mind. Um, we had an election last week. And <laughs> if we didn't, if you didn't know, we had an election last week. Um, New York takes a notoriously long time to count ballots. Uh, some boards of elections have not even touched 
a ballot. I bring this up because uh, this is really going to impact a lot of things that you see on a day to day basis, policy coming out of New York State, policy coming out of your local government. Um, and we're not going to know those results. Some of them we may not know until closer to Christmas. Um, it's going to take a long time, which means, you know, the pendulum of power in New York State still remains at the governor's door. Um, so that's an update on the elections. Uh, yesterday, we had the announcement come out about uh, the Pfizer, um, Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, um, showing some really promising signs that a vaccine is on its way. The thing you need, everybody needs to remember about this is this is going to be a monumental effort to produce just for the United States alone. Um, it's going to be about 600 million doses because the vaccine requires two shots. Um, this, you know, there was a lot of chatter yesterday. Oh, maybe this means New York won't have more restrictions. You know, oh, maybe, no, that's not going to be the case. This vaccine's a long ways off still. Um, and it will be a while before we see it practically uh, take effect in New York. A promising thing for New York is that SUNY Upstate Medical Center is involved in the testing of the vaccine. Um, that may help uh, distri distribution uh, later on if SUNY Medical, Upstate Medical Center is so involved in this, um, that will help New York at least be being right at the top of the queue, uh, hopefully for the vaccine. But it's still, you know, it's still a shot in the dark. We're still waiting. Thanksgiving, I am going to put a link as soon as I'm done um, in the chat for everybody to take a look at. Um, this may be something worth sending to uh, your employees. Lots of people, everyone, I think, is really just having a difficult time thinking about the holidays, uh, thinking about what's to come. You know, this is a time of year where many people travel to go see loved ones, and it's going to be very different this year. Um, now is, is really the time to be, you know, reminding people, look at this travel advisory that exists. Um, look at, you know, other states' data. We don't necessarily, you know, want that to happen in New York. So I will put the CDC guidance. It has some, you know, good information. Um, and hopefully it will be of a help to not just you as employers, but you personally. Um, and with that, I am done. Okay, Katie, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, let's turn now to Teresa. Teresa Rusnick is in our Rochester office. And, you know, we, we got to thinking about, you know, with the lack of activity um, in Congress, uh, sort of here since uh, the flurry of activity at the beginning of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, you know, what, what might happen here? You know, we're going to have the expiration of the uh, FFCRA and New York PSL is coming. And so this kind of marries those two topics together. Teresa, please enlighten us. All right, thanks Pete. Now I don't have a crystal ball as to what Congress is gonna do. I wish I did. It would have come in handy these past couple of weeks and I'm sure it would in the future. Um, and I think some of you saw my face at the beginning of this webinar and started asking your paid sick leave questions and your FFCRA questions, because I've seen those in the chat, I'm gonna try to answer them um, as I wrap us up this afternoon. So as Pete said, for those of you not already aware, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act is set to expire at the end of this year. So a little over a month from now, we will no longer be dealing with the FFCRA. Uh, you know, whether that's going to be extended or what the Biden administration is going to put in place to replace it, you know, we really don't know yet, although certainly we will be keeping a close eye on that. Uh, New York is still planning to move full steam ahead with paid sick leave as of January 1. I know there were various rumors out there that perhaps the enforcement would be delayed or that the entire law would be delayed. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, we're getting closer to the actual a real beginning of that law every day. Uh, so for those of you that are still looking to, you know, update your policies and handbooks, I would really urge you to start looking at that now. Um, I wrote down a little list for myself of the questions that I keep getting asked um, and the, you know, the types of things that we still just don't have good information on. Uh, we still don't have 
clarity on what type of documentation an employer can ask for, uh, if any, or when that can be asked for, for paid sick leave. We're still waiting on how to calculate employer size for those of you that are on the fence between, you know, potentially having to offer 40 or 56 hours or unpaid or paid leave. We're still waiting on information on that. Um, we're still waiting. The guidance did give us some information on how to calculate pay for paid sick leave, but it didn't really give us a good definition of how to calculate regular rate. So we're still awaiting that. Um, there's still some lingering confusion about what to do with your existing collective bargaining agreements and to what extent those need to come in line with paid sick leave as well. So we do still have some open questions out there. Carryover um, is one I do also get quite a few questions on. I know uh, the guidance really didn't do us any favors right now. It does look like any uh, unused available paid sick leave needs to be carried over into the following year, regardless of whether or not you front load the leave um, and you know, regardless of how much leave the employee already has in their bank, um, you know, it would have been easy for the guidance to cap that, uh, but they didn't. So um, unless they do, uh, we're looking at needing to carry over all of your available unused paid sick leave. Um, of course, paid sick leave doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, I told you the FFCRA, the federal law is going away and it is. I will remind you that the New York COVID-19 law is very much still in existence. Uh, as Katie mentioned, we've had an increase in cases here in Western New York where I am. I've had a number of clients reach out and try to understand what leave is applicable to their employees. Um, there's been some confusion if the FFCRA has already been used. Is it available again? The answer to that is no. If someone's already used all their available time under the FFCRA, say for emergency paid sick leave purposes, that's not a continuous amount of leave. Uh, what we kick in then potentially is the New York State COVID-19 leave. Now that's the one, remember, we talked about this one first, way back uh, at the end of March. This is one of New York's first laws. This is, and it kind of got overshadowed by the FFCRA because the FFCRA was broader. But the New York COVID-19 law is the one that's triggered by an order of quarantine from a governmental or local health department or some kind of government agency in New York. So if you have an employee supplying you with one of those orders, that employee needs to be able to take time off and be paid for that time. And depending on the size of your uh, business, it's gonna vary on how much time the employee needs to take. So please don't think that just because you used FFCRA already uh, that there's nothing else left. There's certainly still uh, New York COVID-19 leave. There's the combination of paid family leave and disability leave uh, in certain circumstances as well. As well, for those of you that have FMLA, FMLA could still apply for COVID-19 related absence, disability benefits, et cetera. Uh, we still have many, many leave laws that are uh, still out there, even with the FFCRA going away. Um, you know, Pete, I think that's, I think that's about it for the, um, the intersecting leave laws. I know I could talk about this for, for quite a while, but I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna keep you any longer. Uh, certainly if anyone has questions, feel free to refer to the webinars we've already put out on this. Um, and we're happy to get back to you if you reach out to us with any questions as well. Teresa, thank you. Um, everyone, thanks for being with us today. Um, hopefully this was uh, some helpful information. Feel free to reach out to us if you have questions. And uh, we'll see you again next week. In the, uh, in the meantime, please stay safe.